Jan Tobias, uh, a friend of mine and an ex-colleague from the University of Leuven. Cheers. Uh, he's been hacking cars since he was five, and now he started hacking rockets and planes and... Okay, now I give it to him, he will tell us all about it. My God. Okay, hi guys. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, so uh, cars, I, I don't know why he always wants me to talk about cars. I, I think cars are kind of an old hat, like people have been packing cars since 2010 and it's pretty much done, right? Like, I mean, people know that cars can be hacked and I think there is way more interesting infrastructure. So I, what I'll do today is I'll talk about how to defend infrastructure. Um, I'll talk about cars, but I think no more than two minutes so that he gets his satisfaction out of me talking about cars. But that, that, that's really, that's, that's where it stops. I'm done with cars. Um, yeah, um, if something would play, then something would play, but maybe nothing plays. It should play, but that should be No, no, you have to change the video play. <laughs> no, no, it's not going to I have no clue how to do it. I've never used a Mac in my life. <laughs> Good for you. Um, where is the video? <laughs> so, you know, on, on, on normal, on, on free operating system PDF viewers, this video just plays. Yeah. Okay, so what you see here is something pretty cool. It's a, it's a building in Chicago um, that was built in 2011 and apparently you can play Tetris on it. Um, the, the interesting thing is that all this happens on existing infrastructure. So this is a smart building with a, with a smart light infrastructure and um, what you have there in terms of code and operating systems and connectivity and different light colors and stuff like that is enough to play Tetris out of the box. You just need the software to do that. And the connectivity is all through Wi-Fi. So there are tutorials for you to basically stand next to one of these buildings and get access to the control network and play Tetris on that building. Or you can fly with a drone like up and down the building and switch lights on and off. Um, that's kind of the state of affairs we get. And um, how do I stop this? Maybe like this? And how do I go back to the slides? Okay, um, so the, the thing what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm mildly worried about and what I want to talk about is the complexity of infrastructure that we have these days. So people are trying to build smart cities. You can buy smart cities from Google and from Amazon and, and from different providers and they integrate connectivity. They integrate a lot of different features, a lot of different functionality that you as a citizen might use. And some of that is critical. I mean, there, there is healthcare involved, there is transportation involved, there is smart cars involved, there is um, electricity supply and power grids and, and air pollution metering and all these things, they're kind of integrated and they all use kind of the same connectivity infrastructure. And if someone gets access to these things and manages to manipulate them, we are probably in trouble because, I mean, we live in pretty big metropoles and if something goes wrong on the digital side, um, people might get stuck in a situation they really don't want to get stuck in. Um, and if you think about the role of software in these systems, some of you guys have seen this piece of code before, um, you, you're, you're wondering if we ever get that right. If you know that a modern smart car, 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 yeah, you, um, if, if you know that a modern smart car runs about 150 million lines of code, um, you, you, you'll start worrying if it's ever possible for anyone to revise that huge amount of software and actually make a point that it's correct or, or kind of can be sure, can convince others that this code cannot be broken, cannot be abused in any way. Um, if you see this little one here, then, then um, there is no obvious connection between um, this, this cookie and this buffer and still by overflowing the buffer you can get to the cookie value and overwrite it and these kind of errors, they can exist everywhere. They might exist in your code. Um, then you, of course, have the option to um, test it thoroughly, to maybe even formally verify it, to apply all kinds of fuzzing techniques and stuff like that to find these kind of vulnerabilities. The question is, what if it's not in your code? What if this is in someone else's code, in your operating system, in your libraries and whatever, and it's really outside of your control? You, you can't really review that stack of 160 million lines of code that you might be involved with just to make sure that the thousand lines that you're adding to it to implement some critical functionality is actually um, in, a, in a secure and sane way isolated and implemented so that no one can abuse it. So if, if you're going to think about what 
kind of software is involved in a simple application, let's take this kind of healthcare example here as, an, as, as something, you have like some, some sensors that might be in a patient's room or attached to a patient's body and then you do some measurements and you, put, you send these measurements through some gateways to the cloud where you do all the data processing and then someone else, maybe a healthcare professional, a doctor gets access to the data, gets some user interface to play with it to see what your heart rates are and stuff like that. Just think about all the software and all the hardware that is in that single scenario. There is cloud providers, which is basically just other people's computers, and you have absolutely no clue, uh, no control about what's going on there. There is different operating system, different hardwares on all levels. You don't know what security features they provide. You don't know who implemented them. It was probably not you. It's really, really hard to make a security assessment here. It's really hard to do some basic threat modeling and understanding what that system is and what the trusted components in that system are. And like every now and then we get breaches, right? Like Facebook might, loses, might lose 50 million user profiles. And I think we are currently at a stage where to some extent no one really cares anymore, right? I mean, Facebook might lose the next 50 million profiles tomorrow and it will be in the news for one day, maybe for two days, but then we are done with it. Then something else comes up. Then Trump tweets something and it's apparently more important than your 50 million user profiles. Um, the thing is, what we do in smart infrastructures these days, what we do in, in computing in general, goes far beyond the protection of data. Um, we are more and more building systems that where, where computing has physical consequences, where we control something, where we engage the brakes in a car, where we control how power is distributed in a city, where we might switch um, life support systems in a hospital on and off depending on some, some decisions that are made by software. Um, and these, these things, you know, they get intimate rather quickly. And the typical solution for a security problem like this is normally that, well, you know, a security engineer comes along and he builds another layer of complexity around the broken system. It's, it's not funny, not at all, really. Um, so so our, our current approach to kind of address these problems is to make them more complex, add a layer of functionality that is meant to provide some security, but in the end, we just get a bigger system that is even harder to assess. Um, so things get intimate, um, things get also pretty deadly. So if you think about um, a state level adversary being able to do a power shutdown that lasts for three weeks or maybe even more um, in densely populated areas, then people die, right? Then, then you lose infrastructure that is really critical for society's functioning. And you normally don't want this to happen at any costs. Um, so I think that the state of security is basically that right now. Um, we are pretty able to build super cool, complex things, but we just can't avoid them from joining botnets and from behaving in ways that we never anticipated them to do. And, oops, there. So, um, I, I think, like, no one wants this to have at home, right? No one wants their, their smart vacuum cleaners to become hostile tomorrow and to ask for bitcoins to you know, start vacuum cleaning, basically. That's kind of ridiculous. But in a way, that's where we are. So you should understand that this, you can't read this, but the link is down there and I'll send the slides around. Um, you, you should understand that there, there is a whole ecosystem around breaking infrastructure, selling exploits, um, selling hacked machines, selling access to hacked machines somewhere in the world. If you're just willing to pay it, if you just have those $10 to, um, pay for a hacked machine somewhere in the United States, you can send spam from there and you're um, immune to some mail filtering that might happen on the flow and things like that. So it's, it's, to some extent, it's just a matter of money. How much money you're willing to invest to get access to some system that is breakable or that is broken and you'll typically find someone to do it for you where you can just buy either the exploits or the access to that system right away. Um, in the end, we are all humans, and of course, you can buy us to some extent, and that's the situation that we got there. So there is a whole economic ecosystem around hacking things and getting access to hack things and abusing them in one way or another. You don't have to do that by yourself anymore. Um, I, I think the baseline is that we really, really suck at building distributed systems, in particular at building safety-critical distributed systems that our societies depend on. Um, Mostly that is due to complexity. So no one is still able to assess the complexity of these systems and make 
um, thorough assessments of what you can trust. And basically, that's the root of security. So if we want to understand security, if we are trying to understand what we have to do to make a system secure, we first have to go and really understand that system, right? And um, that is something very different in different contexts. So for example, a web application that you might use for your for your home banking services has completely different security requirements, completely different um, security principles to be built in than let's say a smart fridge or a smart car or some medical appliance that does injections into patients' bodies. Um, you, you really have to be able to understand them. You have to write these things down. You have to understand what the security requirements of these systems are, who might get access to which system, what is a legitimate use case, what is an illegitimate use case. And, and you, you have to be very thorough about defining these things. And only then you might be able to, you know, do some security assessment. Also, you must understand what kind of adversaries you're trying to deal with. What are your attackers? What are their capabilities? Are you trying to defend the CIA or the NSA? Or are you trying to defend against some uh, evil neighbor who might, try, who might try to switch on your vacuum cleaner while you're not at home? Or who wants to find out which dildo product you're using? They are completely different attackers, right? And therefore, their capabilities, what they are probably willing to invest and what kind of technical know-how they might have is very different. And that's part of the whole process of understanding what you're dealing with. Now, the interesting thing is, so far, this is pretty similar to safety, right? You can deal with this in, a, in the same way as you would deal with natural disasters. Now, the interesting thing about security is that we also have to focus on understanding um, how things change and embrace that change. Understand that new attacks might come along tomorrow, that someone might find out that your processor in your smartphone itself has a vulnerability that needs to be dealt with. And you have to adapt your security policies according to that. You have to be able to understand what you have right now and what the impact of that change in the environment imposes. And that's often very, very difficult. And that's where, um, yeah, I think lots of industries are failing to make this thing to be able to maintain a system for a long time but still keep it secure. And we are kind of stuck in this, in this vicious cycle of releasing a product, praying, 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 praying but still getting hacked eventually and then trying to release an update and the cycle starts again. And it's, it's as a whole thing, it's not really sustainable. It's something we should try to address somehow. So, um, What's a good way to address that? Um, we've been following an approach that involves trusted computing. I'll talk a little bit about that. Trusted computing at multiple layers, layers at um, the level of cloud and the level of desktop computers, but also at the level of embedded systems. So we've been looking a lot into car components, for example. Cars, eh? keyword. I'm almost approaching the two minutes on cars, I think. Um, um, where we've been looking into tiny little sensor nodes, for example, and how we can make these ones secure, how we get end-to-end -end security guarantees that, let's say, an application that displays something on a computer is end-to-end -end secure from the sensor readings that come from some IoT device over a cloud application to the display device. And that's a really hard thing to achieve. Um, one of the most important things we are trying to achieve here is to still keep the trusted computing base of that system small. So whenever you define a security property, you want to say for which component the security guarantee exactly holds. And that's quite difficult because as I mentioned before, these systems are huge and lots of things are interconnected. So are there ways that we can use to isolate components from another? Can we run a piece of software in a potentially even compromised operating system that is infected with all sorts of malware and still know that it's the right piece of software doing the right operations? That's the goal of what we are working on. If you can do that, for example, in a car context or in a medical context or in a power grid context, it doesn't really matter. The concepts are the same. The problem is that in all these contexts, you have the problem of having like small devices that are doing sensing and actuating somewhere at the wheel, somewhere in a robot, somewhere in a smart meter at home or something like that, combined with larger systems that have completely different architectures, completely different operating systems, completely different software and security principles from one end to another. And you still want to get some end-to-end -end security. And that's quite tough. So how do we do that? Um, first of all, it's really important that you get your threat modeling right. So if you don't understand whom you're protecting against, what kind of threats you're protecting against, and what your system looks like, you have absolutely no chance to get anywhere. But if you have that, then 
you can worry, you can start wondering about how trustworthy your different components are or or yeah, you know, do you trust your people more? Do you trust your hardware and your software more? But the thing is, we've all seen all these attacks, right? We've seen Heartbleed coming along. We've seen um, that's the crack attacks that's been breaking um, um, Wi-Fi supplicants and a lot of access points all over the world. We've seen Meltdown Inspector and Foreshadow and these things coming along. So we basically know that there are vulnerabilities everywhere. And the critical thing really is to isolate potentially vulnerable components from other potentially vulnerable components so that at least the thing doesn't spread if something breaks. Now, um, yeah, I skipped that for now. Um, the, the question is, if we see stuff like that, what can we still trust? It's not just a processor that is potentially broken, it's someone maliciously implanting additional hardware in computers in a way such that they can even update operating systems remotely or stuff like that. This story is not fully confirmed. There are still lots of worries about whether this is actually true or not, but it's a serious concern that um, in particular state level agencies have these days, that if they buy in components regardless of whether they're hardware or software, they might have backdoors in them and you have to deal with it somehow. So, um, trusted computing, that's the kind of stuff we are working on. There's a lot of architectures around that give you trusted computing principles. What we are particularly looking into is essentially that you can have within an application something that we call an enclave. An enclave is a tiny little isolated piece of software. You might have multiple of those and they are isolated in such a way that even the application itself cannot go in there that the operating system, your libraries, cannot go in there. It's really completely isolated from software, but also isolated from most hardware. So, for example, if we look at modern Intel processors, they provide a technology called SGX, which even encrypts the memory of this little thing. So even if your PC shuts down and someone tries to do a cold boot attack or something like that, or gets the memories out, cools them down and tries to read data, there's no way for um, an attacker to easily tamper with this bit of enclave. No way to get cryptographic keys out, no way to get any kinds of secret out. And that's the kind of basic primitives we are working with. Um, they have a couple of more features. So first of all, they have isolation. The next thing is they have attestation. Attestation is a principle that aims to bind a piece of software to a particular piece of hardware by means of cryptography. I'll explain that a little bit more in detail later, but the idea is that you as a remote party, you can request a cryptographic operation to be, to be performed by this enclave and you can check the result independently. And if the check is successful, you know that the right software is in an unmodified way and in isolation executing on the machine that you expect it to be executing on. That's a pretty strong guarantee that might be from a privacy perspective something you don't want because it establishes linkability between a PC and a piece of software. You may or may not want that, but probably for um, cyber physical systems, for safety critical control systems, we want that because it's infrastructure anyway. So we have the state supplying the code, the state supplying the, or controlling at least the supply of the hardware and the software and controlling how that software has to be tested, has to be evaluated, has to be supplied. So there might as well be such a link to be established. Now, what do we do? Um, we talk about that later. Um, there's a whole range of architectures that give you these kind of guarantees around. Um, the most common ones are probably Trust Zone, which is an ARM processor. So most of your mobile phones probably has to have that and you can establish um, such an enclave that is isolated from the normal Android operating system and the apps that run in that en um, operating system um, so that they are completely isolated and integrity protected from a potentially malicious Android application. There is Intel SGX, which is in a way even a bit stronger. It runs even in the cloud and you can get the same guarantees for applications that run in the cloud with memory protection and all that. And there is also Sankos, which is our own work. So it's a prototype that we've been working on since 2012, 2013, that gives you the same guarantees on very, very lightweight embedded devices. Think of 16-bit microcontrollers that typically have absolutely no security features at all. And we can still add with minor overhead, couple of hardware extensions, um, these kind of strong security guarantees there. How does that work? So let's assume you have a microprocessor, looks like that, has you know, memory backbone, some RAM somewhere attached, has a execution unit that fetches 
memory content and decodes it and, and um, executes it. There's a, there's a arithmetical unit in there. Um, what we've been doing is we've been adding a couple of registers that allow you to define a software module. Let's talk about what a software module is later. And we've been adding a crypto unit that allows us to do really fast cryptographic operations. Um, maybe with non-standard algorithms, but it doesn't matter for now. So we can do really fast crypto and we can isolate software modules. And the software module now is defined by um, its code section, its data section. You know, when you, when you load a program, that program always comes in a couple of sections and they are loaded by your operating system into different parts of the memory. One part is the actual program code and the other one is typically the data part. And what we say is that if we take a hash of this code section and at least the addresses of this continuous data section, we can uniquely identify a piece of software. Now we still have to bind it to the hardware and we do that by having a symmetric key baked into each of these processors. It's created when you switch the processor on the first time, let's say, you can get it out exactly once. So as a person who's deploying the unit, you can get it out, but afterwards you can never get out. And all operations that you do later on are based on key derivations. So if we install such a software module with its sections, we'll implicitly and automatically derive a key that is based on the hash I was just explaining and this hash of the node key. And you can do that as the guy who deployed the processor independently and offline. You know what kind of software you're installing and you got the key. So by, by having that kind of connectivity, by, by having that kind of um, linkage between um, a processor and a piece of code that you're installing there, you get something really cool. If you can communicate with that module in an encrypted way, using the key that is derived here from these two hash functions, um, you actually know that the right software is running on the right processor. And if that code is ever modified, then the key will change as well. Heh, so we got something. We got a pretty strong security guarantee here for a single module. Um, the nice thing is, this is a microprocessor. The, it's based on the OpenMSP430, which has a battery lifetime of about 12 years on an AA cell. So that's even longer than the shelf life of that battery. We've been extending the battery consumption by like 6% or something like that. It's still beyond the shelf life of the, of the, of the, of the battery cell. So it's despite adding some, some pretty strong security things here, we are still really cool in terms of power consumption, and that's nice. And of course, the unit price of such a thing used to be below 50 cents, now it's still below a euro. So we managed to make a really cheap processor with strong security features, and of course, we wanted to play with it. So now come the cars. Um, cars have been hacked before, since 2010, I would say, because first of all, they have a lot of code running on them, and second of all, they're getting more and more connectivity. So what you have these days is you have car Bluetooth, you have car Wi-Fi, you have all sorts of things going on there. And people have been showing that you can abuse all that connectivity to hack a car. So there are videos by some guys from like Miller and Valasek from some guys from the States um, who basically just open the laptop within a car and within a couple of minutes they can take control even of the steering of a driving car. That is, you reprogram the infotainment system through the Bluetooth connectivity, and from there on, you move on towards uh, reprogramming critical control units that have something to do with steering, with engine control, and stuff like that. And eventually, you manage to take over the car. So that's pretty bad, right? So you wouldn't want anyone on the roadside to be able to control your car while you're driving. Um, the interesting thing is that all that communication in a car, or most of the safety critical communication happens through a very simple bus system. It's the CAN bus. It has been developed oh, about 30 years ago. It's old fashioned. It was never considered to be as equipped with security features. It was just out of concept back then because connectivity was not foreseen. And that's something we do a lot in, in IoT systems, in smart factories. We try to connect things to the internet to get better supply chain management and stuff like that. But those things that we are connecting, they were never meant to be connected to a um, open network. And they, now we end up with all sorts of security issues there. And it's pretty much the same thing here. So in this car network, you have a lot of electronic control units, they're, they're called. They might control the steering, they control the engine, they might control the ABS functionality when you're braking and stuff like that. And it's pretty easy for an attacker to just add a new unit and inject messages. It's also pretty easy for an attacker to hijack an existing unit and inject messages on it. 
And people have been thinking about how to fix that. In 2015, there was a new standard that talks about how you do encryption on these networks. It failed in, well, a range of ways. One is that encryption in these networks is super expensive because you have to be really fast, so you need very, very fast crypto. And the next thing is, actually, just doing encryption doesn't solve the problem because you might still have an attacker who is able to somehow inject code on one of these units, run his own code there, and thereby gets access to the cryptographic keys that are being stored there. So what you need is some way of storing keys outside of normal application memory in some secure module, and that's exactly what we've been trying to achieve with Sankos. So we've been arguing for this for a while, and then someone asks us, hey, okay, you promised this, now just implement it. Okay, we did. So we did a model like this, a couple of more models followed later. Um, it's basically um, establishing a couple of these secure microcontrollers with legacy components from broken cars. There was no brain splatter on these. We bought them on, on eBay, but they were all pretty clean and then all fine. We don't know where, they, where we got them from. Um, so what you see in, the, in this picture is essentially the blue thing is the canvas, and we even have an attacker node here on that side that can inject messages, but they are detected at runtime. And it's not that we just attacked these injected messages. No, we get something much stronger. We get a notion that an application module somewhere on, on, an, on an electronic control unit down here, when it communicates with an, with an application module on another unit um, through an authenticated channel, it actually gives us a fresh attestation result every time this communication happens. So every time you receive a valid message, you know as an application model that it comes from another piece of software that belongs to your application that is running on exactly the right microcontroller and has not been modified at all. That's pretty cool, eh? Now the question is, can we extend that to larger systems? Can we um, bring that concept beyond these simple microcontrollers and integrate it you know, with the cloud, with mobile phones, with all kinds of things you might want to have in your networks, or you have already? Um, and that's what we call authentic execution. So authentic execution is a concept where we rely on different protected module architectures, on different trusted computing architectures like Intel SGX in cloud machines or in laptop, like ARM Trust Zone in mobile phones, like Sankos on the low-end embedded side, and we just extend that guarantee from one side to the other. So basically what you get is that when you see an output somewhere in that system on a display or you see a robot arm moving or something like that, you know that all the inputs and all the processing that led to this output being visible um, came from authenticated, integrity-protected software modules. So you really get an end-to-end -end guarantee that no tampering happened anywhere in the processing chains from a sensor node over the cloud to the device that actually produces some visible output. That's cool, eh? You like it? Okay, so that's the kind of stuff we're working on. <clears throat> um, now, I've been presenting this pretty much from the embedded systems and safety critical systems perspective, which might not apply to lots of you. Um, yeah, I, I realize that we are working on things that many people are not that much concerned with, although you should probably. So if you're developing um, smart healthcare applications or IoT applications, you should probably worry about these things because maybe your applications interact somehow with the power grid and might be the entrance for some really bad attack. But anyway, there are a lot of these initiatives, right? Uh, even companies built around these concepts and you can readily use them. So if you're looking for approaches to um, use secure processing on a cloud in a way so that even the cloud provider, even the the guy who installed the hardware cannot get access to the data that you're processing there. You're somewhere interested in this and this. If you're looking for a way to deploy software in such a system without actually modifying it, without having to program with isolated compartments and stuff like that, you're looking for something like that. You're looking for the graphene operating system. There are lots of these initiatives around. There is, for example, a new software development kit from Microsoft coming up that tries to address multiple of these architectures and give you a common framework for programming enclaves. It's, it's a difficult thing to program them. We made so many mistakes in the last couple of years. It's, it's unbelievable, but I think slowly we are getting to a point where it's usable for developers without getting special training and using these techniques, and that's where we have to arrive, I guess. Um, 
After all, there's even a tutorial that we've been presenting last year that shows you the whole chain that allows you to develop an Intel SGX application that communicates over any kind of communication technology with low end Sankos devices. So there's a lot of information about this around that might help you to um, you know, understand the technology, get a bit of a hang of it and, and build at least some sample applications and then think about whether this is something you want to deploy in your, in your future projects. A um, couple of points to mention here. So trusted computing is pretty cool, but it's not the holy grail. So there are things that still don't work or that are problematic. Um, one of them is if you deploy code in such an enclave and your code is broken, your code has some bad vulnerabilities, like the one I was showing on the third slide, this, this little piece of um, printf vulnerability or whatever it was, um, there's nothing to help you. So your enclaves still have to communicate and if that communication might lead to an exploitable vulnerability in your code, then your enclave is broken and there's nothing to save you. It saves you from vulnerabilities outside the enclave and that's a lot of code that is normally considered as trusted in the systems we use these days that becomes untrusted implicitly by using their technology. That's cool. In a way that we can even say that um, in the car scenario, for example, the whole application that we've been implementing, it's a simple ABS brake control system, um, it's just a thousand lines of trusted code that can be isolated, while what you run on every single node is a little operating system, is uh, some, some drivers for communications, communication stack implementations and stuff like that. It's 60, 70,000 lines of code for every single node and we've been isolating that from the thousand, code, thousand lines of code that form the actual application. So you get a dramatic reduction of complexity. You get to a small piece of software that you can probably test very thoroughly and make sure that it doesn't contain bugs. But if you don't do that effort, then you're lost. Then there's nothing you gain here. So that one is important. Um, the next one is trusted execution only helps you if you really understand what you want to protect. So as long as you can't make a solid argument for which pieces of, of your product, which pieces of your, your software components you want to stick in those enclaves and which ones can be untrusted, you probably still can't use it because you still end up with a system that is too large to be assessed. Um, and the next thing is even if those enclaves are pretty much protected against all kinds of influences from the outside, we are more and more experiencing side channel things. They are certainly not immune to, for example, meltdown attacks or spectre attacks. So what we really need is an approach that doesn't just look at software isolation and producing correct, perfect software, but get to something where we actually can say, hey, the hardware is correct, the software is correct, and the isolation gives us additional guarantees. And then we have something cool, but I think we are pretty far away from that. And we first need to fix a bunch of processors. So, summary. Um, I think I'm done here. Am I on time, halfway? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, security is kind of difficult. You need to understand a lot of things to do security in the right way. Probably closed source solutions are not good here. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're actually building an open source processor from the ground up. We are going to build another one, which is going to be released in a couple of months, I guess. But that's the reason why we are really focusing on open source hardware even, and not just open source software or open source uh, communication infrastructures. The next thing is um, trusted computing is a pretty cool thing. It gives you a strong isolation. It still requires you to make sure that you're programming your systems in a in a correct way, in a way that is free of bugs, free of, of vulnerabilities that can later be exploited. And then maybe a summary of Sankos, it's an open source architecture that gives you exactly these guarantees. Um, you can play with the processors, you can synthesize them yourself, you can even add features to them. So if you need an open processor um, implementation that you can use in your IoT projects to, let's say, run an, on, an, on an FPGA and even extend with certain hardware features that were not there in the first place, maybe that's a cool thing to start and get some from the ground up secure infrastructure to build really cool, secure, fast, efficient, whatever you want, IoT systems. There we go. Um, that's it. If you want a link, there's everything. If you want a job, there's also something. <laughs>